Welcome to Talking Ship, the Venture Actual Podcast, where we talk about issues and topics in entrepreneurship. If you're looking for our sister podcast, Ship Talkers, you're in the wrong place. That's our podcast about schooners, yachts, dinghies, catamarans, and tenders. Wrong ship. We're here to talk about entrepreneurship. <laughs> And who are we? We are the Venture Asheville team. Venture Asheville is the high growth entrepreneurship initiative of the Economic Development Coalition for Asheville, Buncombe County. We build entrepreneurs and get startups funded. I'm Jeffrey Kaplan, this ship's captain, director of Venture Asheville and lover of leaves changing. You know, you know, Jay Walker, uh, my co-host for this thing, it just awakens something in me. I am reading my script because I want to prepare this and I get it wrong. Um, I'm not crazy about like pumpkin stuff. I don't, I don't love it, but the changing weather, pretty colors, layered clothes, that's that that speaks to me. Mm. Um, but I do need help with my fall fashion. I really feel like I came <laughs> into my own um, late spring, early summer. Like I finally honed in on what like the Jeff look is, uh, office apparel with like that spring, summer fashion. But I'm feeling very lost in the fall space. So if you have any recommendations or critiques uh, to our guests as well, I am open to them. I've never bought a denim jacket. One of our guests is wearing a denim jacket. My my wife won't let me. Um, but you say it's time? All right, I'll send her a note. Uh, anyway, with me as always is the wonderful, smart, talented, considerate, and creative Juliana Walker, our master of interactive media. Jay Walker, what is good? Everything is good right now because it's fall. Even though it's supposed to be 80 degrees outside today, I am so happy for the weather to be changing, the fall leaves to be changing. It's just, it's going to be great. And I am with you. I am on the fashion train. I love fall fashion. Layers, boots, warm yeah, colors, boots. dark yeah, colors. Yeah, boots are great. Yeah, boots are great. Um, well, for you or our guests, if anyone sees fashionable men walking with my similar build and height um, in downtown, and you're like, hey, that's a good look. Jeff should know about that. I'm looking to build my lookbook right now. Uh, I really do need to step it up. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I just feel like, I'm, again, finally came into my own this year, and I, I've lost all that momentum. I think you could really benefit from a corduroy jacket. I have a corduroy jacket. Ah, yeah. well. That would be I great. Like, I feel like it ages me. I don't really know if that's me per se. And this is the wrong podcast <laughs> for this talk. Just send Jay Kaplan at ventureashville.com. Um, you know, fashion tips for fall. That'd be swell. Jay Walker, this podcast, this interview required more prep than any other we've done. We, <laughs> we have two guests with us, two wonderful women that you and I have the pleasure of working with and learning from. Two rising stars in the EDC. They each have a great story and are part of a groundbreaking economic development initiatives. So I'm not going to do a full bio read on the intro. I'll just say their names and titles and bring them in. Isn't that cool with you? Sounds good to me. Okay, great. With us is Tierra Wilkie, Workforce Partnership Specialist, and Samantha Cole, the Workforce Partnership Manager. You two are the first two co-workers we've had on the podcast. So congratulations to you Ooh, both. Thank you. And now. Such an honor. <laughs> let's talk some ship. Let's, let's do it. And I'll, I'll confess that when I wear my mask and I and I say talking ship, I'm saying shit. Okay. And... <laughs> mm -hmm. Good to know. <laughs> so maybe I can get away with it too. You can't go nuts. So we've got a bunch of questions I want to ask you guys today about your exciting work here. Uh, but first, before we get into what you're doing now, how did you both get here to the chamber in EDC? I think it's interesting. You both started in different roles than you're in today. So could you just give us each a minute on like, you know, your, your starting role and how it's changed to today's role? Sure. Do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually started out in our member services department as a, just a basic um, administrative assistant. And then, you know, last year around July, we started making some internal changes and the opportunity just kind of presented itself to um, kind of kick off a new initiative that we have called the Inclusive Hiring Partners. And from there, we've had several other changes, you know, a couple employees left. And so um, from there, we were able to kind of step into these new workforce development roles. And here we are talking ship. <laughs> That's right. And for me, um, I started here a couple years back in the public policy department, working with our colleague, Corey. 
Um, I came from a background in government and nonprofit work. And whenever I started here, it felt like a natural entry point to economic development for me. Um, and then shortly there after the pandemic began, we learned that um, the initiative Tierra mentioned, Inclusive Hiring Partners, which we both work on now a good bit together, um, had received some funding from the Golden Leaf Foundation, and we both got the opportunity to move over to the EDC team and work on that uh, for the bulk of our time. So I've been over here in workforce development ever since. It's awesome. Um, one of the things about the chamber in EDC that most people don't know is our policy is to promote internally first. So whenever we have an opening, um, you know, the higher ups circulate and look at the team of who would move up before advertising outside. I think it's a great policy and I, and I hope that a lot of organizations do something similar. And I don't know if he's li listens to the podcast, but if I hear you guys right, the subtext is the best thing for our team was Ryan Regan leaving <laughs> and how that opened up a whole new alignment of resources and human capital into these new positions. Like he, not just him leaving, but the fact that the Golden Leaf Foundation grant came in to, to build IHP. Never. We love Ryan. No, we do. I, Ryan, I if you're regularly. listening, we miss you, buddy. <laughs> Hope you're doing well. I miss Emily more. Anyway, um, <laughs> so tell us what, what you guys do now. What is IHP and what does it mean to be a workforce partnership specialist and manager? Well, um, I'd say back in 2018. Is that right? Whenever. Yes. Uh, so back in 2018, which is probably before either my time or Tierra's time here with the Chamber or UDC, um, our colleague April and some other folks we work with put a survey out into the field that kind of measured how regional employers were interpreting workforce and their workforce needs in particular. And about 700 and change employers responded to it over the broader labor shed, over several counties, I think it was like 11 counties we had respondents from. And a really surprising number of them, I guess, so 71 plus percent of them said that their primary source of talent recruitment was personal relationships and contacts. And from that, we've kind of extrapolated a lot of things over the past two years. And one of those is, what do you do if you're a person who isn't necessarily experiencing a lot of relationships or contacts that are going to enable you to develop a good entry point into a well-paying career? And then when you peel that layer back even further, you can kind of see that there are, of course, unfortunately, a number of communities here that have been disconnected from those opportunities for quite some time. Yes. So April and a number of other really amazing community leaders like Philip Cooper, who's a partner with us in this work, and a number of folks from the Asheville Housing Authority, Community Action Opportunities, and other area nonprofit organizations who have been doing this amazing work on the ground for a long time all came together and had a long series of conversations about how can we find a way to connect this set of communities who have been disconnected from opportunity for a long time with all of these employers who are struggling to hire and have all these available roles and are really interested in growing over the next three to five years, but need the labor and need the workforce to be able to do that. So together they developed a grant proposal um, Golden Leaf Foundation very generously funded it and Inclusive Hiring Partners was born. And that is something that Tiara and I work together on a lot. Um, and we are really passionate about it. Is there anything that I missed? No, I think you covered the gist. You know, overall, we're just trying to keep individuals who may have those barriers from being able to, we, we don't want them to be um, left out of any opportunities or the overall economic prosperity of the region just because of those barriers. So I think it's amazing that we have a lot of employers who understand that and want to be more diverse and inclusive in their um, work practices and culture. So um, it's definitely going to be a process. We've had to make some changes along the way, but I definitely say we're on the, the right road. It'll just it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Unfortunately. Yeah, the name, I think, is, is smart. IHP, Inclusive Hiring Partners. Yes. Going back to the root of what you're saying, Samantha, when 70 to 80 percent of um, people doing the hiring are looking at their networks, their social networks, their volunteer networks, their church, wherever they spend time out, the kids' school, wherever they're spending time outside of work, it's going to foster the, the kind of the feedback cycle of homogeneity mm -hmm. of people who look like you, who talk like you from the same economic background as you. Absolutely. So th this, it takes intentionality to be inclusive. 
And this, what I love about this program is it gives our employers a framework for how to hire inclusively, but also from the workforce side, right? It, doesn't it help train the workforce, get ready for jobs in these types of companies? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have partnered with other organizations like um, AB Tech and Goodwill Industries and NC Works because we don't really want to reinvent the wheel. You know, we just want to leverage the resources that are already available. So that looks like connecting individuals who may need some resume review or interview preparation, um, or maybe there's certain credentials or diplomas that are needed for a certain position. So we're just able to leverage those resources and, you know, get them connected to those opportunities. I love hearing that when, you know, uh, as Clark Duncan, our boss says, more is more. And as I like to say, you know, all birds fly south for winter, but the ones who fly in formation get there faster and look better doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, all right, we don't need to recreate the wheel. What we need to do is have more interconnectedness between resources and being the source and the funnel for all those. Fantastic. So it's, it seems like a straightforward solution, right? We got problems. We got job seekers. We got employers that need to hire. They want to be more inclusive. It should be a slam dunk. What are the biggest challenges you're facing? I think when we first actually kind of launched this initiative, we had the thought of um, that it would be harder to like recruit employers, but it, it we found out that it's been you know quite the opposite. So there, you know, this the past two years or so have been so crazy and unpredictable, and everyone's had to you know pivot one way or the other. I think what we've come to realize is that there are a lot more variables that go into. Um, to it all for the job seeker side of things. So it's not always about just being able to find a good, good job with good wages. You know, we may have individuals that are on housing and, and things like that. So it's not as easy to just jump into a high wage opportunity because that kind of, that has the potential to eliminate other resources that they currently have in place. So there's definitely a lot of, you know, moving parts that go into it. And it's just all about how we, we go about it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think you're alluding to the benefits, Cliff. Absolutely. Yes. And is it too early to talk about benefits, Cliff, or work that y'all are doing in that space? No. Do you no. want? I, I, didn't, I didn't prepare to talk about this today, but do you guys want to bring it up? Sure. I yeah. Think I think it's very exciting and, and worth sharing. Yeah. So um, I think, in general, something that Jeff and Tira were just alluding to is that one of our more significant challenges with ensuring that. Um, this initiative is able to reach a good number of job seekers and pair a good number of job seekers who are specifically facing those employment barriers, which I guess we didn't name them earlier, but they include everything from folks who have a former justice involvement or folks who are previously incarcerated to people who are living in intergenerational poverty, um, folks who have survived domestic violence, um, unfortunately, in many cases, even being a military veteran can be an employment barrier, and mm -hmm. we hate to see that. Um, but in any situation that we just mentioned, if you're a person who's struggling um, financially or socioeconomically, a reality for you might include the benefits cliff, which is if you're making a little more, if you're making, and apparently I've read that a more problematic amount of money to be making more of is somewhere in the $13 to $17 an hour range, which on its face sounds closer to a living wage. Um, but once some families start making that amount of money, if they're enrolled in um, benefits like Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program or SNAP, they might lose those benefits. And then the wage increase that you would theoretically see with that higher hourly rate then sort of disappears. And it's less that that family is receiving. It's less support that they've been depending on that they're able to um, kind of carry on with. And it's a huge inhibitor to folks feeling the confidence or the support or even, you know, really the social scaffolding to be able to pursue a, a career opportunity. And that's a huge, a huge barrier for people that our partners are working with. Yeah. So, so not to get on my own soapbox here, but I'm going to take the opportunity to say the other side of the coin here is, um, when you hear about systemic oppression and keep people in poverty, this is an example of that. The fact that you're making $13 an hour, you lose all public benefits. So it incentivizes people to keep lower wage jobs to have lower rent and food assistance, and all those things. So that's, you know, it's, I understand the, the good intentions where these programs come from, but when you hear about systemic racism, systemic intergenerational poverty, th this is one of those things. Um, so you guys face truly a mountain 
of, of challenges and, and problems in front of you. So a question I like to ask folks is in your dream state, if, every, if you had unlimited budget, unlimited resources, unlimited, unlimited time, what could you achieve through your work? Um, this, this is a great question. And honestly, there's so many ideas running through my head, but just to kind of stay on the topic that we're currently in, I think it would be more towards just closing the opportunity gap in general. And what we've, I've actually um, had a meeting last week with Philip Cooper and several other community members around this topic. Um, what we learned was that it is, it's, it starts when, you know, when they're in their youth, you know, eight years, five years, or I'm sorry, five years to eight years and older, because if we can catch them while they're young and help to make sure that they, you know, have the resources that they need to thrive and um, just kind of start out on the right track, then it makes it a little less harder for us to be having these conversations when um, they're between the ages of 18 and 24, because that is the typical demographic demographic that we're working with. So I would say putting more effort into building this interconnected, as you referred to earlier, pipeline to really just, you know, help people get from point A to point B. And that's that's a long term sustainability kind of thing. So that's where I'm at. Samantha, anything in your dream state? Yeah, I think all of all of that, of all of the resources that we could compile to help close that opportunity gap. So I think in my fantasy land, if we had um, indefinite amounts of support and money, we would make sure that there was free childcare available for every family yes. who needed it, that there were enough spaces regardless of the age of the child, not just, you know, universal pre-K, but universal daycare period starting at age zero. Um, ensuring that the, that nutrition assistance we were talking about earlier is ubiquitous, regardless of whether or not you meet certain qualifications based on your income. If it's something your family needs, it's there for you. You can use it um, and then taper off of it if you end up not needing it anymore. Um, all of those, those kinds of really essential things that so many of us think of as completely, you know, they're staples of our lives. That's not true for so many people. And I think that it's very easy to take that for granted if that's not a barrier you're facing or if that's not a situation that you are particularly in. Um, but those things are hugely important. And if we could, you know, if we had all the money in the world to fix those problems and expand those opportunities, we would do it in a second. So this is certainly one of our probably heavier podcasts we've done. Usually it's that grant making, you know, organizations that throw money around in, in great ways and help spur entrepreneurship. And we've talked to educators at the universities and we've talked to other entrepreneurs. So I, I do want to get some of that. I've been muted this whole time. Uh, so Jay Walker, you could notice that time signature and fix that. Uh, this is one of our heavier podcasts where you know, we've talked about some really serious societal issues. I do want to get a chance to talk about you both as co-workers and our culture here a little bit, kind of bring some light and fun to that. Uh, we begin this podcast and Samantha, you said something to Tierra. I think our mics were off. We haven't, we haven't started recording yet. You think you said, thank you for validating me. <laughs> so I, I want to yeah. put you both in the spot. You both started in different departments, public policy and member services, right? And then over a year or so in a pandemic, we're put on, on the same team, working very closely together. What's it been like working together? What do you like about working with each other? What do you like about your team with April and Max? Uh, you know, like you said, validating each other, Samantha. So what is it that makes your team work so well? Um, well, for me, honestly, whenever I had first kind of made this transition to start working with Samantha and April, I was a little intimidated, not really sure what to expect because of course we've all worked together under the same roof, but we never really had those one-on-one -on -one interactions. So I wasn't really sure what to expect and I was, blown away, you know, how well we work together mm -hmm. and how great we kind of feed off of each other. You know, we're able to, if there's something that she has, you know, more strength that, you know, we kind of just bounce off, off of each other in that way. So I would say it's been an amazing experience. And I know that for sure, regardless of wherever life takes us, like I have made two lifelong friends. Me too. We have a group chat, like we, we talk about all the things. So yeah, I definitely love these ladies. Same. I think, you know, beginning my work over here on this this team over on the EDC side rather than the chamber side, 
I wasn't necessarily um, sure what all to expect, except for lots of jokes and humor, obviously, because we get to work with each other. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think Tierra is all heart, and it's really awesome to be able to work on um, an initiative like this and really all of our workforce development um, initiatives with someone who cares so deeply about what the purpose in something is not the purpose of it not why we're doing it but actually what the um what the potential is in all the things that we're doing all the time awesome you know i often hear that um asheville can be a challenging town for young professionals and you're both young professionals um what's it been like living in this area um even in old fort right but spending time across this region and uh, you know, what, what's it been like for you guys? Like, what do you guys work on? What are you involved with outside of work? Outside of work, um, I have done some service on the board of the Young Professionals of Asheville. Um, my term on that board concluded over the summer and our very own Juliana is now um, in that position, which is awesome. Um, but I would say that as a young professional, it's a really it's a really exciting place to live. There are infinite things to do outside, which I personally really love, um, and it's been really rewarding, especially during a pandemic, to be able to have so many places to go outside and get fresh air and connect with people in a more safe way. And um, yeah, I mean, pre-pandemic, obviously, if you are interested in wine and beer and food and um, having fellowship with people around all three of those things, you're going to have amazing opportunity to do that here. So I loved that too. Yeah, I would say for myself as a young professional in the Asheville area, um, I actually own a personal finance and credit consultancy by the name of Groundbreaking Financial. And one of the best things about Asheville is that there are always different cohorts and um, incubators and just different resources available for small business owners and young professionals. So being able to connect with like-minded individuals and kind of um, get feedback and just, you know, be, have access to different resources in the community has been great. And I would say um, another reason I, I love my job so much, but a, one reason for sure is all of my clientele and connections have come directly through the chamber. So that's been amazing in itself. I think that everyone in town, like everyone you meet, it's, it's two common things about people who, who live here. They all have some outdoors interest, whether it's hiking, biking, uh, rafting, whitewater rafting, or, or sand and paddle boarding, or whatever it is. Everyone does something outdoors. Mm -hmm. And the other is almost everyone has a side hustle. Like no matter what your yeah. job <laughs> is or where you are and what your company, uh, it, I think it's, it's awesome. It speaks to the entrepreneurial spirit of the people who live here. Uh, what's the best thing about working with me? <laughs> Oh, Jeff. Well, you definitely light up any single room that you're in. Um, there's, I could go on forever about the best things, but I would say the worst thing is going after you in oh, a presentation. No, yes. no. Going after you in a presentation yep. because the you you set the bar pretty high, man. So some tough shoes to fill. But no, Jeff, you're great. Um, I was kind of joking with you. I didn't need so many compliments. Oh, okay. Well, it's, let me um, just. I'll, it there. You know what, I find, what I find about this team, and I, I really just came here from a presentation where I was with Clark Duncan, April Brown, and this, this, our team, everyone is so well versed in, I think, public speaking and presentation styles and how to throw a PowerPoint together, how to own the room, how to convey our, our messages, which can be complicated and very complex and making it very relevant to any audience. I've always been amazed that even Max, too, right? Like you put anybody on our team in front of a crowd. And they can sell the importance of the EDC. I've always been very impressed with everyone on our team in that respect. Um, other things about Asheville in this area. Uh, do you have a favorite restaurant or coffee shop or give a shout out to uh, the food and drink scene that makes Asheville so popular? Okay, so <laughs> my favorite, <laughs> this is actually funny. So our favorite restaurant, me and the kids, our favorite comfort food place is Texas Roadhouse. And this the funny story behind this, my son actually had to create a business plan for school. Sure enough, he built a Texas roadhouse and his business plan the other day. And he's like, I did this for you, mom. So I guess that's that's a that's saying he that did we it eat for there you. a little too much. For you. That's is, is it a franchise? What was, what was it, it was, yeah. It was a franchise. Yes. I love that. 
I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> I love it. I am a really big fan of Liberty House Cafe. Whenever I first moved here, I um, was up off of Charlotte Street with my husband, and um, we used to be able to walk there and had many a nice Sunday coffee and breakfast down there after runs or whatever we were doing, and um, love that place. We love Chop Shop, the, the butcher, which was, again, steps from our old apartment, and um, now that we're out closer to Fairview, I think Fries Above Bakehouse gets a lot of business mm. from our household. Wonderful baked goods. I got to plug Liberty House. Home of a $9 pancake. Is it sourdough pancake, right? Yeah, it's worth every penny. And it's, I mean, it, it's like the perfect mold of a skillet. Like they mm -hmm. fill the whole thing up, right? It, it's, yeah, it is worth every penny. Mm -hmm. That is a fantastic pancake. Probably the best pancake in town. Sub question. Best cookie in town. Oh. Gonna have to go with the city bakery snickerdoodle. Great choice, great choice. I would take the well bred chocolate chip cookie. Yeah. I was going with well bread as well, yeah. but they're molasses cookies. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And they're like the yeah. size of your face, so it's yep. pretty mm -hmm. amazing. <laughs> they're having their third location opening up in the Grove Arcade. Pretty excited about that. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> What about favorite entrepreneurs in town or businesses outside the food and beverage scene? What are some of your favorites, people you want to give some love to? Yeah, so um, one of my favorite entrepreneurs actually is a, a lady by the name of Yvette Freeman, and she's the founder and publisher of the Envoy magazine. So it's really a magazine that's geared towards featuring and um, you know connecting with women of color or just women in general and entrepreneurs in the Asheville area. So I really love that. She has a great magazine. I'll shout out to one of them is obviously Tiara, who is <laughs> running <laughs> groundbreaking financial um, in the middle of doing all of this and being a mom. And I think it's amazing. Um, and I think the other is probably Jefferson Ellison, who we've been yes. working with a good bit for um, inclusive hiring partners and our workforce development initiatives in general. I think he is a creative force in this community that we have benefited from a lot in our work. And um, I learned so much from him and um, I'm very, I just love how creative he is and his clothing and um, his marketing expertise, all of it. It's great. Yeah, I second that. Shout out to you, Jefferson. <laughs> and that's with job breaking. Yes. Job breaking creative and they've opened a retail shop as well. Right. I have one bone to pick with Jefferson that I will pick with him in person when I see him. Uh, He's a big Twitter fan, and I've become anti-Twitter recently. Hmm. But he might I, have your fall outfit suggestions. You will ooh, be I, yes. I think you're That's right actually about a really that. good point. I think you're very right about that. Yeah. I just think I think Twitter is bad for your health. I think the short hot takes of every opinion, I think is is uh, one of the things that's tearing our society apart. Other than <laughs> that, I think Jefferson's phenomenal. I think he's great choices. <laughs> uh, all right. What's something nobody asks you that you want them to know about what you do? It's a great question. It's tricky. I guess at the end of the day, if I were to zoom out and just kind of talk about that from the lens of economic development rather than my particular role, what I'd say is that um, giving it a quick once over, I imagine it's very easy to think about economic development as um, sort of the, the examples of it that you see commonly, which are, you know, big jobs announcements, ribbon cuttings. Also known as buffalo hunting or elephant sure, hunting. Board yeah. meetings, all of that stuff. But I think the, the intention and the purpose wrapped up in it, deep down in it, is really just about making sure that everyone, people, communities, families have opportunity. And I think that that's why I do this work. And I think it's why a number of my colleagues do this work. And that's not something that, um, I guess, in terms of, in terms of purpose, that's not always something that's necessarily that, um, transparent about it for casual onlookers, but I, but it's, it's hugely important to it. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback off of that. Um, workforce or economic development in general is just, it's never, I never thought I would see myself being here. And I had a conversation with someone a couple of weeks ago and they just mentioned that 
you know, this isn't, it's not really for the faint of heart. Like you really have to like love what you, what love what you do, because it's all about, Mm -hmm. it's all about that, that energy and that effort that you put into it. And I'm learning more and more every day that that's so true. And I wouldn't now at this point, like I couldn't see myself doing anything else. Like I, I love being able to help make an impact in individual's life and kind of just look at the larger picture, you know, so much more than us. So, yeah. Awesome. Those are great comments. And I I totally agree. You know, I've always believed that entrepreneurship is the most um, independent striving movement of our time. The ability for someone to learn how to start a business, to create their own wealth, to be, to have their own self reliance. And I've always been so impressed in the progressive nature of our EDC to have a venture Asheville as part of our strategy that we're not some standalone nonprofit. People are always surprised that we are part of this, you know, five strategies, five strategies, what is it? Five strategies, five years, one goal as our tagline is for AVL five by five. Um, yeah, I'm very proud to be part of this team and let's work with you guys. Same. Yeah. Uh, Jay Walker, it's time to bring you back in. Did you have any questions for our coworkers? I think uh, this has been a, a really lovely and informative conversation. You know, I sit two cubes down from Samantha and one cube down from Tierra, and I still don't know what they're doing half the time because they do so much. And I'm I'm just constantly impressed, and it's great to just sit down and hear about the amazing work you guys are doing. Um, but I guess I what 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 I would ask is, you know, what's coming up? What's what's on your plate right now? Yeah, so we, um, quite a few things, but one in particular coming up this week. So with the Inclusive Hiring Partners, we put together um, kind of like a series of events, community engagement events. And these are really just geared towards connecting with community, um, you know, bringing resources to where they are, and also just, you know, posing the question of like, how can we be more supportive? Like, what are things that we can do? Like, what are your needs? That kind of thing. So these community engagement events are family friendly. And so we do like bouncy houses and things like that for the kids and um, ice cream trucks and there'll be food, but it's a way for us to also bring together our employer partners as well as our community partners and just have that engagement and build that connection. So that is coming up this Thursday at Hillcrest Apartments from four to seven. So we're definitely looking forward to that. Um, and then also um, another program, sorry, not to go off on a tangent, but another program that we have is Next AVL. And so that's a nine-month mentorship program geared towards connecting second and third year college students to local professionals in the area. And so that cohort just kicked off with about 15 students. And so we're also really excited about that as well, just being able to kind of create that space for individuals to hopefully um, find local opportunities and want to stay here after graduation. Tierra is doing amazing work on, on all of the above. Thank you. <laughs> We're also um, working together with our partners at the Mountain Area Workforce Development Board to host the Western North Carolina Career Expo next month. It's Tuesday, October 12th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. down at the Ag Center, specifically the Davis Event Center. Um, we're folding in a couple of extra components to hopefully make it more COVID safe. So. Um, much more space between booths and open doors for the indoor section, lots of booths outside for fresh air, Um, all eating and drinking outside, masks required, the whole nine yards. Um, But I'm really excited about the kind of opportunities folks are going to be promoting there because it seems like most of our employers are hiring for at least one job that pays $18 an hour or more. Um, Many of them have indicated that they're excited to talk to people who may or may not have employment barriers like previous justice involvement or incarceration or um, folks who are even, you know, experienced professionals, i.e. folks who have workforce experience but might be over the age of 50 and therefore could have a more difficult time connecting with certain opportunities if they're interested in new ones. So um, we're really looking forward to that, too. Now, I almost feel guilty taking so much of your time. Um, you guys have so much going on and we're so many great initiatives. Uh, so if I'm a listener, how do I keep up with what you all are doing? Is there is there a Facebook page? Is there a website? Is there a newsletter? How do we keep up with your team? We have an inclusive hiring partners newsletter. Um, we'd love to include you on that, um, listeners out there. So feel free to get in touch with us. 
uh, through our website. There's an inclusive hiring partners section on our website that is uh, curated very well by our dear Juliana. Thank you, Juliana. Um, and you can let us know through that for sure. Awesome. I think this is, uh, I, I can't hold you any longer. So thank you for talking ship with us. Uh, thank you for all the work you're doing in our community. And uh, I guess at this point, Jay Walker's got the background music rolling, rolling. And Juliana, we got like two episodes of recording this week. So we've got yep, a few more coming out episodes. for our listeners. Um, so we're, we're almost at the end of our season. I think we'll have a 10 episode season, right? A 10 episode run. Yep. That'll wrap up this season of talking ship. This might be the best episode. And I don't tell all of our guests that. I swear. I swear I don't. Okay. <laughs> we'll just have to listen to see. Yeah. Right. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.